From a clinical point of view, one of the things I have seen is that some younger people are reluctant to go get the vaccine because they either had a reaction to go prior to the vaccine with headaches and fevers, or from when they had a meningococcal vaccine and had a reaction. Is there any plus data about how this vaccine was in regard to that? And what about the issue of guillain barre Is that an issue that we should be worried about? There is um, a vaccine adverse events reporting system that does exist, and that is a system that is a passive system, and anybody can put in anything that they would like to say about a particular vaccine. There's also been a number of reports that IOM has been asked to generate that's trying to evaluate all the data that we have, you know, that would try to pull the story together. And the best that we can say at this point in time is that um, there does not appear to be any causal relationship between many of the, um, the events that people have reported and vaccine delivery. The one exception that we do believe is an issue was the Guillain-Barre back in the 70s. And the reason for that has been investigated for by a number of people trying to figure out what the reason was. It is an area that we are aware of that will come back and people will ask the questions that you've just asked. And what we can say again at this point in time is that is on the everybody's radar scope and there's going to be very aggressive monitoring of adverse events in a more active way not just a passive way but a very active way and uh, people don't understand Guillain-Barre and if you talk to specialists neurological specialists Guillain-Barre is is a syndrome that they lump everything in if you don't know what it is it's Guillain-Barre so what is it we're, we're even at that level of trying to figure out how to actually identify it because we're not even quite sure what it is it's a clinical definition and so it makes it again very difficult to try to understand what they were seeing back in the 70s and what we may be trying to monitor now so that is an area of concern it's it's noticed and we're trying very hard to be able to identify but we're not going to know until afterwards I, I just add uh, and build on Carol's uh, comments I mean, she, she's right on the mark with the the message I think that there are several things first of all the 1976 event where we had about one per million vaccinees of the 40 uh, uh, of the group out there uh, excuse me one per hundred thousand of the 45 million vaccinees went on and developed Guillain-Barre syndrome and that clearly was demonstrated but when we don't know why. But what we do have is since that time, 100 million to upwards of 300 million people a year being vaccinated by seasonal flu vaccines since that time, for which we have no evidence of this increased occurrence of Guillain-Barre syndrome. And that's been looked for and looked at. And this vaccine, if it weren't a pandemic situation, this vaccine would be no different than seasonal flu. We would exchange one antigen out for another. It's the same platform. It's the same means of production. It's the same safety features. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the problems is to ensure safety. There were no shortcuts taken. So that's one of the reasons why it's taken as long to make it. And so I feel like the body of data for the last 30 years of seasonal flu vaccine is an incredible number of people who have been vaccinated where this hasn't been demonstrated. As far as your point about other reactions, sure, you can hit people who can coincidentally report anything. Every day in this country, 2,000 women have spontaneous abortions. Uh, that's just what occurs. But surely some of those will have been vaccinated in the last 24 to 36 hours, which in their mind will connect a spontaneous abortion to the vaccine. A thousand people will be hospitalized today in intensive care units with heart attacks. Well, surely some of those will have had vaccine in the previous week that would now tie back to that, even though that's just what's going to occur. I think what we're talking about here is really trying to, with every ounce of our ability to understand, should something emerge, can we pick it up quickly and what, what that might be? I can't imagine what it would be. I don't believe that will happen. But what I can tell you is that if we don't get vaccine out there, and even as this peak may wane now, it may be, we don't know that for a fact, there will still be people who will get it who will die who wouldn't have to. If we see a resurgence with another peak in January, February, which based on historic perspective surely could happen, we will have people die needlessly. And the analogy I use, if you think, well, it's not going to happen to you, it's like your seatbelt. Why do you put your seatbelt on every day? Because you know, you know you're not going to have an accident today. You haven't had one all your life. And you know that even if you have an accident, so what? 
you know, it's going to be a minor fender bender. Ask everybody today who gets killed in an automobile accident who didn't have their seatbelt on what happened because you can't put it on in the middle of the collision. And so this vaccine to me is my seatbelt and I would not want to leave home without it. Dr. Hyman, just one last question. Um, every year, uh, virologists sit around the table and they decide which strains should be included in the seasonal flu vaccine. 90% of what's circulating right now is H1N1. Is there any chance that it will be included in next year's seasonal flu vaccine or will it remain a separate vaccine? Very good chance it will be included in next year's. It's already been included in the Southern Hemisphere's <coughs> decision mm -hmm. for seasonal flu. So if it continues the way it is, you can expect it to be part of the seasonal flu vaccine. A break um, uh, for our networking and, and some refreshments. Um, uh, would you like to give us a, an element of a prescription for um, how we should move forward? <laughs> prescription. Well, get the vaccine out there. That's right. <laughs> and make it easier for people to understand where it is, because I'm having difficulty. <laughs> um, and uh, I think there is a lot of scope for more international uh, cooperation. There's very good cooperation at the moment in relation to surveillance. There's some cooperation in relation to helping out uh, developing countries. That could be much more, uh, we could be more effective at that. Um, and I think there needs to be more co cooperation really in terms of communication. Uh, this is the thing that's, it's becoming a sort of personal obsession of mine. But if you've got half of the, as you were saying, if you've got half the population desperate to have a vaccine and the other half refusing, and that is not so different from Europe, but you can take it country by country then we have to be much clearer about what the messages are. <coughs> and it shouldn't just be regarded uh, as a question for an individual. It should be regarded as something to do with your social general responsibility as well. Thank you. Dr. Hyman, would you like to um, provide us with an ingredient for that prescription? Well, I do want to say uh, this is about my fifth um, episode like this that I've been through, and each one we've learned from the previous one. And the experiences that we've had, at least among the governments, and this includes European governments, WHO as a representative of many governments, has been really remarkable this time around. You know, there has been very active communication, daily basis, updating each other of what's going on. I think we have to look at exactly the issues that we didn't do well on. And that was really, the, quite frankly, the, this is the first time we really had to distribute as, as rapidly and as carefully as we've had. And there's issues. So I think if I was to do anything, I think we have to go back, lessons learned, and take a look about how to fix that for the next round. I think the key message here is that if nothing does change with this pandemic and this is as bad as it gets, I worry desperately that people will say, oh, it wasn't so bad. And all I would remind you is that pandemics date back to antiquity and they come in all shapes and sizes and there'll be pandemics in the future. And the next one may not be anything like this one. And if we don't learn from this one as to what worked and what didn't work, what did we do and didn't do, what could we do and what must we do for the future, we'll regret it. Because one day, imagine today where we'd be, we wouldn't be having this meeting if this was a 1918-like pandemic and two to three percent of the population was dying. We would all be afraid in our homes. The international just-in-time economy would come to a screeching halt and the implications would be wide and far. That is surely a possibility for the future. And in fact, I would predict unless we have that universal vaccine, it will one day happen. So I worry that people will walk away from this one feeling, okay, we got through it, we're done. And that would be the worst lesson that we could learn of all the lessons that we might have here. Well, thank you very much. And I, I want to thank um, our distinguished panelists uh, today, Mr. Merkel, Dr. Heilman, Dr. Osterholm. Uh, three of the finest minds working in this area. Th thank you so much for your, uh, your participation, for the information that you've shared, and for underscoring with us that cooperation, collaboration, and communication really are the hallmarks in our fight against microbes, which I want to remind everyone are um, the largest killers of people throughout human history and therefore decisive shapers of human history, and we must remain vigilant against them. Well, we're going to take a 20-minute break. There's some refreshments. We'll return with our second panel that's going to really focus in on the cooperation, the collaboration across countries in responding to this pandemic. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.